All right, Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, the Bible reads, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. The title of the sermon tonight is In the Midst of Wolves. Think about it for a moment. God is sending us as his people, as his workers, into uh, the, the, the midst of wolves. Is everyone on camera? Is that, is, sorry, was, was it the camera? Okay, okay, sorry, sorry. That's right. So, yeah, just, just think about that. Think about the fact that God is sending us there in the midst of wolves. You know, the, the word God has given us, you know, not just the door to door sowing, but all, this, all the servitude that we can have for God and serve God, it's amongst wolves. We are sheep going amongst wolves, you know, in the likelihood that by serving God, we're going to harm ourselves. We're going to be hurt by those that seek to hurt the people of God or to hate the people of God. Let's start off with verse number one, though. Let's get the context of what Jesus is talking about here. Verse number one. And by the way, this is quite a chunky chapter. So I'm going to try my best to get through this as best as I can. Now, I, I, I told you guys that in the, in the church in Queensland, I'm preaching through the book of Luke. Okay, And I kind of regret doing the book of Matthew with you guys at this point in time, in one regard, because sometimes I get confused. You know, because you know, there's a lot of similar stories in the two books, obviously. So sometimes I get confused. Did I cover that last time? We, we, you know, um, but one of the advantages that I've seen by going through two, two Gospels in quite a lot of depth is you realize just how many layers the Word of God has. Like you, you might find Jesus teaching one topic, and then one book takes that one layer and, and expands, expands in that layer. And then you go to another book of the Bible, let's say Matthew, you know, from Luke, and then you go to Matthew, you see the same teaching, but Matthew takes a different layer to that teaching and applies that truth in another area. And so it's really interesting how, how deep the Bible is. I'm really appreciative that God has given us four accounts of the gospel, of the, you know, the, the, um, the ministry of Christ, because we get a lot of that unraveling as we look, compare the different books of the Bible. So let's start off with verse number one there, Matthew 10 verse 1. It says, and when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. So you see here that Christ calls 12 of his disciples and he gives them power over unclean spirits. Okay. Now, this is something that today in our New Testament time, that we today do not have this power necessarily to, you know, heal, heal people from, from sicknesses, you know, just, just at our command and things like that. You'll see that this was at a certain uh, period of time when God gave this kind of power to his disciples, okay? And these things were given to the apostles and the apostles passed them down to others, okay? This was a sign of their apostleship, but today we don't have the apostles, okay? These powers have come to an end and we'll see this as we go through. But what we now see is the selection of the 12 apostles, the selection of these 12 disciples that we know of. And this is a good time for us to just stop quickly and, and understand who were these 12 apostles? Who were these 12 men that God gave this special privilege to? Look at verse number two. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. The first Simon, who is called Peter. Okay, so you guys know Peter's very familiar, right, as an apostle of Christ, the one that denies Christ three times when Christ was uh, uh, arrested. Okay, his name was Simon, and Jesus also called him Peter. Okay, and the, uh, the Aramaic version of that name was Cephas. So when you go read for your Bible, you see Cephas, named Cephas, that's also Simon Peter that's been referred to. But notice it says, and Andrew, his brother. So here we have in this group of 12 apostles, I don't know if you realize, there's at least three um, groups of brothers. So the first one here is Simon and his brother Andrew. And if you know the story, Andrew's the one that first realized who Christ was, you know, by the preaching of John the Baptist. Then he goes and finds Peter and says, hey, we found the Messiah. You know, so he's the one that got uh, Simon Peter on board, even though it's Peter that's kind of more renowned in the Bible. And then look at the next two names, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. So there's our, our next uh, pair of brothers, right? We've got James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. They're also known as the sons of thunder. Now, just to get you to understand who these two are, James, that first James there, some people call him James the Greater. That's a title that's given to him uh, amongst, you know, just in the theological circles. He's James the Greater. Because there's another James in this list, and he's known as James the Lesser. Okay? Now, James the Greater... He is the guy that gets killed by Herod 
in Acts chapter 12. Okay, so if you read through Acts chapter 12, the James that gets killed is James here, the brother of John. Okay, and of course, John, we know John very well because he's the writer of the, 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 the Gospel of John. He's the writer of 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and the book of Revelation. Okay, he, he's the, uh, the disciple um, who Christ loves is, is another reference to him. So there we have another uh, a pair of brothers right there. Now let's keep looking. It says in verse number 3, Philip and Bartholomew. Now it's interesting that God puts these two together because it's Philip that recruited Bartholomew. Okay, he's the one that went to Bartholomew and said, hey, we found Christ as well, kind of like what Andrew did to um, Peter. Now Bartholomew is also known by the name of Nathaniel. Okay, so if you read about Nathaniel as the apostle, that's also Bartholomew. Okay, it's the, it's the same person. Now, if, if you kind of know what, what does Bartholomew mean, if you know the, the three words there, Bath, B-A-R, that means son of. So his, uh, Bartholomew is the son of Ptolemy. So it's possible that Nathaniel's father was Ptolemy. And so they call him Bartholomew because he's the son of Ptolemy. Okay? So that's just a possibility there. But just so you know, you know, he goes by Bartholomew. He also goes by Nathaniel. All right? And then we've got, um, it says Thomas, the next one in verse number three. Of course, doubting Thomas, you know, the one when Christ was resurrected. He had some doubts whether that was true or not. And then it says Matthew the publican. You know, again, that's, that's uh, Levi. He's also known as Levi in the Bible. He's a publican. And he's also recognized as being the author of this very gospel, the book of Matthew. Okay. And then it says James, the son of Alphaeus. So that's James the lesser. Remember there were two James. That's James the lesser. James, the son of Alphaeus. And then it says, and Labias. Now, Labias, you might say, I've never heard of that name before. Who is that guy? Labias is also known as Judas. Okay. But not Judas Iscariot. This is a good Judas. All right. Now, um, I'll just quickly read to you from Luke 6.16, which talks about the same group, just very quickly. It says, and Judas, the brother of James. So when we fill that in there, okay, back in verse number three, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Labias, that's James, okay, who's the brother, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Judas, who's the brother of James. So there we have another group of brothers, okay, it's James and Labias, they're, they're brothers, okay, James or, and Judas, they're brothers. Whose, name, whose surname is Thaddeus. And then number four, Simon the Canaanite, we'll, we'll touch upon him very soon. And then it says, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. So there were two Judases, okay? And it's Judas Iscariot who was the unsaved betrayer of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I hope that gives you an idea of, of these men, who they were. But I want you to just notice that there were three, at least three sets of brothers that we know of in this group. And I think this is really encouraging to know that, you know, as parents that have, you know, more than one child that, you know, that, that have brethren, brothers and sisters, that our children can serve the Lord together. You know, I think it's such a great thing that these brothers got together and say, hey, let's just serve the Lord together. You know, and, and, and what, what a blessing for their family, you know, for their parents to know that these, my, you know, my sons, they're following after Christ. They're working together and, and serving Him. So I think it's a great thing, you know, sometimes our, our children don't want to work together. They don't want to necessarily do the same things together. But one thing that they can be brought together to do is to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. I think, you know, when my kids get older, I'd love to send my boys, even my, you know, my, one of my boys, one of, the, one of his sisters, out door-to-door soul winning together, you know, getting into laboring together. We see that Christ chose brothers, you know, because that, there's obviously that strong family bond there. And so that there's an advantage due to being brethren and serving the Lord together. Now, I wanted to go back to Simon the Canaanite there in verse number four. And I think this is important because Simon in, in another, I think it's in the book of Luke, he's also known as Simon the Zealot. Okay, if you guys have heard of that before. And I want to touch upon this very quickly because there's a misunderstanding of the Bible. Okay, there's a misunderstanding in the sense that there's a teaching out there that says that Jesus really, when he first came, his point of coming was for the Jews only. I mean, there's a, there's a real, people really believe he came for the Jews. And because the Jews largely rejected him, then he went and, and, and you know, died on the cross and, and made himself available to the Gentiles also. Okay? But what's really stupid about that belief is that one of his 12 apostles was Simon the Canaanite. Okay? This, this is not a Jewish man. Okay, he's, he's not a Jew, he's a Canaanite. Now, just to help you understand that, if you remember when, when uh, Moses uh, delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt, right? They, they, and they were journeying to the Promised Land. Remember Joshua led them into the Promised Land? And what was that land known as? It was known as the land of Canaan. And the people on that land were known as 
the Canaanites. All right? So these are people that are not Jewish, that are not traditionally the children of God, as it will. And yet even then, Jesus has the mindset to select Simon, the Canaanite, someone that is non-Jewish, to be one of his 12 apostles. And I think the fact that he's called Simon uh, the Zealot is very important, or, or Zelotes, Simon Zelotes, which means Zealot, because he was someone that was on fire for God. He was someone that had a great zeal to serve God. And Jesus saw that in him and goes, look, it doesn't matter if you're not a Jew. I'm going to take you because you're someone that wants to serve the Lord. You know, and he's known as Simon Zelotes. Okay? Now, there's a, there's a misteaching as well out there, which I'll just let you guys know in case you hear about it. They'll say, well, the zealots, you've got that all wrong, Brother Kevin, they'll say, you know, the zealots were people that were like this militia in the time of of the Roman Empire. And, uh, you know, they were were just a militia of men that would get together and fight against the Roman Empire. You know, they they, 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 uh, kind of like terrorists. They go and and destroy certain things. They'll do this. But the problem with that is that that uh, militia group of the zealots did not exist for another 30 years after Christ. So the history behind that is wrong. But that's what some people teach because they they want to get away from thinking that God selected a non-Jew to be one of his 12 apostles. They have a problem with that because it it doesn't go with their theology. But you can see that, you know, yes, Jesus Christ came to the Jew first, but he also came to the Gentiles. We'll have a look at that later on. But I hope that gives you a good idea of who these 12 apostles were. Okay, let's keep reading. Verse number five, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, go not into the way of the Gentiles. And into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So, what were these twelve to do? To go to the Jews, to go to the lost house of Israel, to find those that would that would you know should have been the children of God. They were unsaved. They weren't. They weren't putting their faith on Christ. They were going out there to preach the gospel. But Jesus made it very abundantly clear. Look, you're going to the house of Israel. Don't go to the Gentiles. Don't go to the Samaritans. Go to the uh, 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 Jews first. Now, that might sound a little bit unfair to some of you. I don't know. It might sound a little bit unfair, but this is just a reality of the Bible. Is that when Christ came, he came first to his people, as it were, in the flesh, the Jews. Okay? And I'll just quickly read to you from Romans 1.16. And Romans is an epistle written to Gentiles. It's written to the Romans. Okay? It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ... For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. But then it says this, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Because what Paul is doing, he's following the pattern that Christ left. You know, they were coming to the Israelites. They were the ones that were meant to be the children of God. They were the ones that were meant to receive the Messiah. And so the good news were coming to them first. But the intention was, just because they're first, the intention was that the gospel would eventually go everywhere as well. Okay, the intention was, and, and it did happen, many of the Jews believed on him. And many of the Jews then went out and preached the gospel to this lost and dying world. But even though it says to the Jew first, in the same book of Romans, in Romans 10, 12, it later on says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So, you know, as far as salvation is concerned, God has made sure that the gospel would go out to Jews and to Greeks, to Gentiles, Samaritans, all alike, that everybody that would call upon them, the Lord, will be saved. And that's a great promise that we have. Okay? The reason we're saved today is because eventually, once, once the gospel got out into Israel, then the believers spread out throughout the whole world, started preaching the gospel to all the places, and then eventually, 2,000 years later, we hear about it, we can be saved. Praise God for that. All right? So let's keep reading verse number 7. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 7. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now look, in another place in the the Bible, I won't go there. It says after Jesus gave them the command to preach the kingdom of heaven, it says they went and preached the gospel. Okay, preaching the kingdom is preaching the gospel. Okay, because when you preach the gospel to someone and they believe on Christ, they believe him. Then what happens? They enter into that kingdom of God, spiritually speaking. And so preaching the gospel is preaching the, go- uh, preaching the kingdom of heaven, is preaching the gospel. But notice that it says here in verse 7, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What does that mean? What does it mean to be at hand? It means it's, it's available 
right around the corner. It's close by. You can take the kingdom of heaven right now if it's what you want. And this is a reality, guys. When we go out and we preach door to door, when we preach to our family, to our friends, we are bringing that kingdom of heaven nigh. We are bringing that kingdom of heaven near, literally to their doorstep. Okay, And it's available because it's right there. If they want to believe on Christ, then they enter into the kingdom right there and then. You know, what a blessing. And we shouldn't shy away from, from saying that to people, that, hey, today is the day of salvation. You can receive eternal life right now if you were to believe on Him, because they will enter into that kingdom of heaven. Hey, brother. Let's keep reading verse number 8. Verse number 8. So we're in Matthew 10, verse 8. It says, Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. You say, wow, is that our instruction? <laughs> Are we to clean, you know, heal the lepers and, and raise the dead? Cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. Now, let me, I'll just say that again. This is not an instruction for us. You know, we're not called to go out there looking for devils and cast them out of people. You know, we're not called to get out there to the hospitals and, and you know, pray over people and get them all healed up. Okay, it's not going to happen. Those, those powers we saw were given to those 12 apostles for a reason. Okay, they haven't been given onto us. And if you think I'm just trying to get away from the Bible, let's just keep reading it. Let's have a look at this. Verse number 9. Because Jesus says to do these things to his, to his 12 disciples, isn't he? He's saying, heal, heal, the, heal the sick, etc. But look at verse number 9. It says, provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses. It says, look, when you go out and preach, don't even take money with you. Okay? And then verse number 10, no scrip. That word scrip is basically like a, like a backpack. You know, a backpack with, with stuff that you need. No scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. It says, look, when you go out, you 12, when you go out preaching the gospel, don't take anything else. Don't take a change of clothes. Don't take extra shoes. Don't take anything with you. It's all going to be provided for you is what Jesus is saying, okay? For the workman is worthy of his meat. Don't worry. God's going to provide. When he sees you working, he's going to provide the things that you need to do this work for him. Now, let me show you why this is no longer applicable to us today, including what we just read in verse number 9, healing the sick, casting out devils, all those kinds of things. Keep your finger there and turn to Luke chapter 22. Okay, Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Because this is much later into his ministry. When we look at Luke chapter 22, verse 35, look at this. Luke 22, verse 35. This is later in the ministry, right near the end. In fact, I believe this is Christ's final week before he's, uh, before he's crucified here in Luke 22, verse 35. It says, And he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, Lack ye anything? And they said nothing. So there's the fulfillment of what we just read before, right? In Matthew uh, chapter 10. It says, when I sent you out without money, without shoes, did you, did you lack anything? And they said nothing. Wow. You know, God truly provided. But look at verse 36. Then said he unto them, but now, hey, something has changed. But now, he that hath a purse, let him take it. And likewise his scrip. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Hey, even you need physical protection. All right. So we can see that something has changed from the time that Jesus was physically walking on the earth, sending out his 12 to cast out devils, not to take anything with them. He says, but now at the end of his ministry, in this last week before he's crucified, he says, but now you've got to take all your stuff with you. Okay. So you can see there's been this change of the instruction that was being given to them. But unfortunately, you have the charismatics, you have the Pentecostals that would read back in Matthew chapter 10 in verse number, you know, verse number eight, heal the sick and cleanse the lepers. And they're like, yeah, that's what God has given us to do. No, you know, that was an instruction given to those early apostles of Christ. OK, and they were given the other instructions to take nothing with you. But now he's changed it all. And he says, look, take what you have with you. OK, so um, Let's keep reading then. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 10, verse 11. If I haven't made that clear, please, please let me know, okay? But something has definitely changed from the... I don't know exactly why that is, okay? I don't really fully understand it. But all I know is, from according to the scriptures, is there has been a change, okay? And obviously, it's got something to do with Christ being physically there on the earth and then no longer being on the earth, okay? But let's keep reading. Verse number 11, verse number 11. And into whatsoever, so this is Matthew, Matthew 10, verse 11. And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy 
for there abide till you go thence. So it says, look, when you go into a city or you go into a town to preach the gospel and you go to your first house, see if that person is worthy for, and what's, what does it mean to be worthy? How are we worthy before God? The only way to be worthy is to be a believer. The only way to be worthy is to have your sins forgiven, okay? So it says, look, if you go into a city and you find a believer, someone that's worthy, he says, then in, inquire and there abide till you go thence. So it says, look, go, find a house, establish yourself, stay there with a fellow brother in Christ, and from that place, do your work. Go and preach the gospel to the city. It says, and there abide till you go thence. So stay in that house, go and preach the whole city until you leave. Okay, stay in one place is what he's saying. And then verse 12, and when you come into an house, salute it. So when we go door to door soul winning guys and people open the doors, we should salute people. We should be friendly, say hi. You know, my name is such and such. You know, salute people. Same thing these people were doing when they were going house to house. Verse number 13, and if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let, uh, let your peace return to you. All right. So, and then verse 14, and whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, keep arguing with them, keep trying to convince them if they won't hear you. No, what does it says here? When you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust off your feet. Listen, when we go door to door soul winning and someone says to you, I'm not interested, and they want to hear it. You know, does Jesus say get offended? Does Jesus say keep debating with them, trying to, no, look, do your best to get them interested. But if they're truly not interested, just move on. Shake the dust off your feet, as it were, and move on to the next house. Don't get offended. Just go to the next house, you know. And we should be people that have a mindset. You know, there's been days, I don't know about you guys, but there's been days when I've gone soul winning and like just maybe the weather's hot, it's uncomfortable. No one's interested, not interested, not interested. No one's home, no one's home, no one's home, not interested. And you just feel like, man, this day's just going to be one of those bad soul winning days, right? But then you get to like to the last house and someone's there ready to believe the gospel and be saved. I mean, it's happened to so many people. When I talk to people about soul winning, how many times is it the last house that someone gets saved? And you know, our, our mentality behind that should be, well, God's just moving us on. God's just moving us through the houses to eventually find that person. You know, otherwise, if you get stuck with someone that's not interested, you know, then you're never going to make your way to that final house. You know, you're going to run out of time before you get to that last person. So that's the instruction we should take on board when we read this. All right, let's keep reading verse number uh, 15. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Now, the next, next week in the next chapter, I'm going to preach more about biblical tolerance. Have you ever been told, you know, as a Christian, you should be more tolerant? Doesn't the Bible teach tolerance? It does teach tolerance, and we'll cover that next week, all right? But I want you to notice here, because Sodom and Gomorrah, that, that was, they were wicked cities, okay? But the Bible says, look, it's going to be more tolerable for them in the day of judgment than for that city. You know, for the people that we go and we preach the gospel, we have the words of life, we have the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and, we're going to, and, and they reject us. At, at the day of judgment, it's going to be worse for them than for these people that perish in Sodom and Gomorrah. That's hard to wrap your minds around, but we'll cover that next week. But just, just very quickly so you understand, is that when you're someone that has the gospel presented to you and you reject it time and time and time again, it's going to be worse for you, okay? Hellfire, being judged in, in hell, you know, is not equal to everybody. Not every, you know, it's not like everybody just suffers equally. You know, for those that are more wicked, they're going to suffer more than others. For those that had the, had the opportunity to believe the gospel, maybe they were raised in a Christian home, maybe they went to church, and they still rejected the gospel. It's going to be even worse for them in that day because they've had the opportunities where others have not had the same opportunities as others. Okay, But we'll cover that next week when we go into that. Uh, Jesus teaches on that much more next week, or in the next chapter, I should say. Uh, but uh, verse number 16 and this is the verse we spoke about. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. You know, God does not want us to be ignorant when we go out and we do the great works for God. You know, truly, before we go out and we preach the gospel door to door, before we go out and do some great works for God, we need to first realize, God, you know, there's dangers out there. You know, there are people that hate the Lord. There are wicked people that would not, want nothing more than to hurt His children let alone Satan and, and his ministers, you know, and, and the devils, they don't want people going out and preaching the gospel, you know. And so before we go out, we should be praying to the Lord to give us protection, to give us safety as we go out and do his, 
his work, you know. But it says, look, be, be harmless, or sorry, be wise as serpents. You know, it's the serpent. Have you ever seen a, a documentary of animals where, you know, the, the serpent looks at the prey, finds its weakness, and eventually it lashes out at, at that prey, right? But the point is the serpent studies. The serpent studies out its prey. You know, it studies out, this is going to be my meal, and how do I creep up to it? You know, we need to be people that have studied the Word of God. We need to be people that are aware of potential dangers, you know, we shouldn't be sending, you know, uh, you know, two ladies out soul winning in a very dangerous area without, you know, a few men in the same area or anything like that. We need to be mindful about how we go about and do our door-to-door -door soul winning. But at the same time, we should be harmless as doves, okay? We shouldn't be people that are just trying to strike like the serpent. We're not trying to, you know, we're not trying to devour these people. We're not trying to call down fire from heaven to destroy those that don't want to believe the gospel, okay? We should be coming as people, as, as neighbors, as people that have a genuine heart for the lost, that's how we truly should be, but we should be aware of the dangers that might come our way when we go door to door soul winning. But thank God we live in Australia. I mean, literally there are parts of the world where you really are in danger of preaching the gospel. I would say largely we're not, but even though, you know, we're not in, the, in that same sense, we shouldn't get, you know, um, what's the word? We shouldn't become, you know, comfortable in that situation because Satan is, you know, or one of his devils could be around, you know, trying to cause us some, some type of damage. Let's keep reading verse number 17. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, for they will scourge, scourge you, you in their synagogues. Now, there's something interesting. This is where this chapter gets really deep. Okay? Obviously, he's given these instructions to his 12 apostles, but it's not just that. This is what I'm saying. The Bible has many layers. Now, Jesus is not, not just teaching the 12 apostles, but he's also teaching on the end times. Okay, teaching on the end time, because you'll soon see he gets straight into the tribulation period. Okay, as, as we go on, as we keep reading this, okay. Verse number 18. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver, shall, sorry, but when they deliver you, take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father, which speaketh in you. So you see these 12, uh, 12 were given, uh, they said, look, if you get arrested and brought before magistrates and authorities, don't worry. You don't need to prepare yourself. You don't need to prepare a defense. The Holy Spoke will speak on your behalf. You know, it's an amazing thing. And people then will say, well, you know, what about today? You know, are, are we also meant to, if we get arrested and brought before governors, are we not to prepare a defense? Are we not to get a lawyer to represent us? No, no, no. We should do all those kinds of things, okay? Because, yes, that was applicable to the time of Jesus. It's also applicable to the end times, okay? But today, we should still, like, we, you know, like Jesus said, but now, you know, have your purse, have your script, have your shoes, take a sword. We should be people that are ready to, to defend ourselves if that time comes. But we'll soon see, if you guys can keep your finger there, turn to Mark. Turn to the book of Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. Because I want to show you these exact same words are spoken in the book of Mark, but Mark makes it much clearer that Jesus is actually speaking of the end times. I'll just show you this. Mark 13 verse 8. Mark 13 verse 8. Look, it says here, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there, sh there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. For those of you guys that know about end times, about the, you know, the end times, the beginning of sorrows is the first three and a half years of that final seven years. Some people refer to this as the tribulation. Following the beginning of sorrows comes the great tribulation when the Antichrist rises himself and persecutes the children of God. Okay, So we can see straight away when we read the book of Mark here, in Mark 13, is that this is about the end times. But let's keep reading verse number 9. But take heed to yourselves... For they shall deliver you up to the councils, and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, neither do ye premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost." You see that it's literally word for word the same as we saw in Matthew chapter 10. But this time it's made very clear that Jesus is speaking about the end times. Okay, So this is what I mean about the Bible. It's, it's, it's multi-layered. It's very deep. Jesus is teaching something to his disciples now, but he's also teaching us principles about that future time. 
you know. And I would say to you that if we are that final generation, or if our children are that final generation, they go through these times where they're being delivered up and brought before magistrates, where they're going through the beginning of sorrows, they're going through the tribulation, then at that point, hey, you're not going to need your lawyers. You're not going to need all those kinds of things because the whole, there, will be, there will be, according to this, a moving of the Holy Ghost where literally you'll be able to stand before these magistrates and the Holy Ghost will give you words to speak, you know, to defend yourself. And that, that's an amazing thing that, that's promised to us that's going to come on those last days, all right? But uh, so let's go back to Matthew chapter 10, verse 21. Matthew chapter 10, verse 21. So, yes, just, just keep that in your thought. The 12 disciples with Jesus, that was, that's what he's teaching, but also the end times. Okay, these two things are, are running parallel as we go through this chapter. Verse 21. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child. I mean, this is unbelievable to me. This is unbelievable to me that in the last days, that br brothers are literally going to betray their own brothers, their own flesh and blood. And then it says, and the father, the child, you know, a, a parent whose child believes on Christ, they're going to deliver that child up to these authorities, you know, to be persecuted. And then it says, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. I mean, that just blows my mind. But when I look at our society today, I think it's not that far off. I mean, children seem to hate their parents. Okay. They, they, it's almost like they can't stand their parents. And um, verse number 22, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, and, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Okay? He that endureth to the end shall be saved. Now, if we keep it within the context, okay, um, we should, it should be pretty obvious what it means, um, he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Because verse 21 just spoke about, you know, your, your blood relatives delivering you unto death. Okay? This is not about the soul salvation. This is not about going to heaven. This is about a physical death. Okay? Because then it says, uh, but he that endureth to the end. So if you make it to the end, you, you, you will be saved. You will be physically saved. Because we know that at the end of the tribulation, Jesus Christ comes back to, to rapture his believers. And that, that's the salvation that Jesus is speaking about. But yeah, some people use this to say, look, you've got to endure to the end. You need to live a faithful life. You need to be serving God. You need to make yourself disciples and go out preaching the gospel. And if you keep in the faith and if you endure to the end, then you will be saved in the sense that you'll be forgiven of your sins and that you'll go to heaven. So they teach a works-based gospel taking this verse out of its context. Okay, But I'm just going to read to you very quickly. Um, actually, no, I won't read that passage. Can you guys go back to Mark 13? Mark 13. Keep your finger there. Go back to Mark 13. I should have told you to stay there. Mark 13, because it makes it a little bit clearer here. In Mark 13, verse 12, Mark 13, verse 12, it says, Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father the son, and children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men, of all men for my name's sake, but he that endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. So we see the support of the book of Mark as well, speaking about the physical death, okay, and the salvation from that physical death that comes, all right, if you endure to the end. But let me just quickly read to you from Galatians 1, 6, and you guys are familiar with this passage. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there will be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Hey, and those that teach that salvation is enduring to the end. Let's say, you know, being faithful to Christ, that's your salvation. Hey, they're the ones that, that uh, per, uh, uh, pervert the gospel. They're the ones that are bringing another gospel. There is only one gospel. Salvation has always been by grace through faith, okay? It's always been that Christ has done all the work. It's been that God will bring that sacrifice. It's always been by the shedding of blood provided by God that people were saved, okay? And so when you read this, it says, verse 8, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. What does it mean to be under the curse of God? It means someone that's not saved. Someone that is not saved is under the curse of God. Okay, but when you become saved, Christ has become the curse for you. Okay, he's taken that curse off you and put it on himself that was, and, and was nailed to the cross for your sake. Okay, and so let these people that preach another gospel, let them be accursed. 
as though it be they're still unsaved. Okay, and then it says, as we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. You know, uh, Paul writes this twice to the Galatians. Twice, let them be accursed. So please, when you read a passage like this that sounds like, hold on, do we have to endure to be saved? Just read the context. The context. Very clearly, it's about the physical salvation, physical salvation of the flesh. All right? Back to Matthew chapter 10, please. Verse 23. Verse 23. But when they persecute you in this city, flee into another. So, and now, now this is about Jerusalem. We know that. This is about, because Jesus Christ was, was on his way to Jerusalem as he's teaching this stuff. But he says, look, when they persecute you, go into another city. Okay? Now, why? And if this were, if this was our last generation, if this was us, and we're being persecuted in Sydney, okay, the instruction that's being given is to flee into another. Okay. Now you'll be thinking, man, does that mean we have to flee for our lives? You know, is, is are we trying to get away from death? Partly, okay, partly. But the reason to flee is so we can go to another city and influence that city. So we can go to another city and preach the gospel. That's what we've been called to do. All right, because look what it says there. It says, "For verily or truly I say unto you, you shall have not go- sorry, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come." So you can see how Jesus now is talking about also talking about the end times, about the coming of Christ. And he says, "Look, if you flee from one city to another, it says, for verily I say unto you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel. There's still going to be plenty of cities for you to go to. You're not going to run out of cities." Is what Jesus is saying, okay? You go into the cities, you go and you can just continue doing the work of God, you continue preaching the gospel of the kingdom to all nations, okay? That we saw before that the gospel needs to go out throughout all the nations. And one way that God achieves this is by bringing persecution into an area so his believers escape and, and continue preaching the gospel in other areas. This is our last chance, if this is us going for this, this is our last chance to earn great rewards in heaven, okay? It's our last chance. Verse number 24, please. Matthew 10, 24. The, the, and you're saying, well, oh, this, is, this is really bad. Like, I don't want to be persecuted. I don't want to be, you know, potentially my own family being, you know, t- presenting me before the magistrates, you know, and, and maybe being put to death. But look at verse 24. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. Look, you, you, Jesus is saying, look, you're not better than me. I'm your Lord. I'm your master. You're not going to get things better than I am. We know that Jesus was persecuted. We know that he was taken and put to death. He, he was tortured, you know, leading up to the cross and died on the cross. It says in verse 25, It is enough for the disciple to, uh, that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? So Jesus just says, look, if they call me Beelzebub, if they call me devil, you know, what are they? they're going to call you the same thing because I'm your master and you're my servant. Okay, Verse 26, Fear them not therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. Because when you get a sermon like this about the end times, about the persecution, the potential death, it does bring fear to some extent. Okay, I mean, that's just a natural thing. But that's why Jesus says in verse 26, fear not them therefore. God doesn't want us to fear. Okay. It says, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed. Hey, these people that hate believers, these people that are wicked, that hate uh, the children of God, that uh, preach another gospel or whatever, these, these wicked people, the Bible says that they're going to be revealed. Okay, It's going to be made known as, as to who they truly are. Even if it's not in this life, it's definitely going to come in the judgment to come. Okay, God's going to make sure that whatever we suffer for His name will be repaid to these wicked, wicked people. It's not going to be hid. All right. And verse number 27 is the flip side for us. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light, and what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. <laughs> now, this is it's, it's so contrary to what we think, right? That in, in the time of persecution, in the time of tribulation, when the Antichrist and his minions want to kill the people of God, Jesus says, that's not a time to be quiet. Preach it from the housetops, he says. You know, go out and preach the gospel. And one thing that you'll notice, guys, is that if you're someone, and we'll see this later on, if you're someone that's not afraid of losing their life for Christ, you're going to be that person that perseveres to the end. You're going to be that person that makes it all the way. But the believers that try to protect themselves, they go and hide and try to save their lives, they're going to be the ones that lose their lives. Okay? Because during this time, there's obviously going to be some sort of supernatural protection that comes from God. 
All right. I'll show you that in a moment. Let's keep reading verse number 28. And fear them, uh, and fear, sorry, and fear not them which kill the body. He says, look, what's the worst they can do to you? They can kill your body. Say, what's the worst thing that can happen to your life? Maybe die. Jesus, don't worry about it. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like to Jesus, dying is not a big deal. Okay? Because dying, is, we know that life is a vapor. We know that we're here a moment, gone the next. All right? I'm, 30, I'm 37. You know, I might live another 37 years. and That's kind of like the average age. And that might be the end of me. And I've already gone, I potentially have already gone through half my life. And I feel like I wasn't a little child that long ago. You know what I mean? But, you know, life goes, but look, here's the thing. You know, beyond life, there's eternity. There's, there's the blessings of being with Christ forever, being with God forever. And obviously, that's, gonna, that's eternity. That's going to be forever. It's like to Christ, you know, dying isn't really that big of a deal. In fact, it's wonderful. Because all the, if you've died for the name of Christ, it's going to be rewarded greatly. And as we get toward the end of this chapter, you will notice that it's about the rewards. Christ wants to encourage us with the rewards to come. So don't, don't, don't fear them that can kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. Hey, they can't kill your soul. They can't cast you into hell. But rather fear him, him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Hey, who's that? Who can cast both soul and body in hell? That's obviously God. Okay? God is the one that can do such thing. And this is how you overcome the fear of man, is when you have a healthy fear of God. When you fear the one that can kill the body, the one that can cast souls, he's not going to cast your soul into hell if you're a believer, but he has that power to do it to the unbelievers. Fear God, and if you have a good measure of fear of God, then the fear of man will, will, will diminish away because you're more concerned about pleasing God. You're more concerned about doing the things that he has commanded us to do, and that will prevent you from fearing those that can potentially kill your body. Look at verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. He says, I don't know what a farthing is. I'm assuming uh, uh, probably something very cheap. But it says, look, two sparrows are sold for that amount. Okay. And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. He says, look, even when a little bird dies, God the father knows. Okay. And if God knows about the little creature that dies, how much more does he care for you? How much more does he know about you? How much more is he aware when you're going through pain and suffering and tribulation? You know, God does not leave our side. And look at verse 30. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. God knows every little hair on your head as well. That's how much He cares for you. And then it says, verse 31. Fear ye not therefore, for ye are more value than many sparrows. You know, if God looks after the little sparrow, how much more is He going to look after you? And if we're this final generation, guys, going through this time, yes, there's going to be some amount of fear, but just fear God, okay? He cares for you. He knows your situation. Do what He's called us to do, preaching the gospel. He'll take care of you. That's the promise of God. You know, and it's, it's probably hard to understand that, but that's the word of God. That's what He's given us. How many times did Jesus say, don't fear? Here. You know, He doesn't want us to fear. And truly, I believe if there's, a, if there's an outpouring of the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Ghost upon the last generation of believers, I can see how believers can be strong and stand firm for God and do the works that God has called them to do. Verse 32, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. What an honor. If, if you go out and you confess people, you know, Christ, you know, if that's soul winning, you know, tell your family and your friends about what Christ has done for you, the gospel, you confess him, then Jesus says, I will confess also before my father, which is in heaven. Jesus will confess about you and he'll tell God the father, hey, brother so-and-so, you know, brother Luke, you know, is out there every week preaching the gospel. You know, and, uh, you know, brother Daniel was out there preaching the gospel and whoever it is that's going out there, Jesus will confess that to the heavenly father. What an honor, what a privilege, you know, to be put in that situation. And verse 33, but whosoever shall deny me before men. And if you stay quiet, you never preach the gospel. You never had a heart to win the souls of men. It says, him will I also deny before my father, which is in heaven. What a sad thing. You know, yeah, you can be saved. That's a wonderful thing. But you can be denied by Christ in the sense that He's not going to speak highly of you. He's not going to praise you to the Father because you've not taken the instruction that God has given us seriously. Now, you know, when it says deny my Father, that's not a loss of salvation or anything like that. Okay? It's just you're not going to get the praise that those that served Christ will receive. I'll just read to you from 2 Timothy 2.12. It says, if we suffer, if we suffer for Christ, we shall also reign, yeah, we shall also reign with Him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. And then it says in verse 13, If we believe not, 
Yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. So even though he denies you in the sense that you're not going to be able to rule and reign and get the rewards that you could have got, he's not going to deny you in the sense of being cast out because the Bible says that he cannot deny himself. Because once you're saved, you have Christ living in you. You have the Holy Ghost in you. And God cannot deny himself. Once you're saved, you're saved. You can't lose it, even if you're a, a foolish, lazy Christian. Okay? Now let's go back to Matthew 10, please. Matthew 10, verse 34. Matthew 10, verse 34. Sorry that it's a long sermon, but it is a very deep chapter. Uh, Matthew 10, 34. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. So, so what? You know, when we, we talked about this before, but in Christmas, right? We sing that hymn, you know, peace on earth and mercy mild. Say, so, well, he's come to bring peace, hasn't he? But hold on, he says here that he's not come to bring peace, send peace on the earth. But that's because at the end of that hymn, he goes, God and sin is reconciled. The peace that Jesus Christ came to bring was to reconcile God and sinners. Okay, God and man, that's the gospel. He did not send us here to be peacemakers in the sense of going to war-torn countries, you know, and, 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 and bring about world peace. You're never going to achieve that. Okay, that's only going to be possible. That's only going to happen once Christ comes, establishes his thousand-year kingdom. Then there's going to be some element of peace on the earth, okay? But uh, let's keep reading verse 35. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the mother-in-law against her uh, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. You know, and I thank God that I grew up in a Christian home. I thank God that I had godly parents, and they encouraged me to serve the Lord and to know the Bible, all these kinds of things. I'm, I'm happy that I don't have a broken home in that sense. But maybe some of you have not grown up in a Christian home. Maybe some of you are saved today. You've tried to give the gospel to your family, to your parents, to your brothers and sisters, and they've rejected it. And not only rejected the gospel, but maybe it's brought division between you and them. Okay? I know, you know, there are, I hear a lot of testimonies of people that, you know, families that might be a staunch Catholic or something like that, someone gets saved and they're like, you know, how, how could you turn against... It's not just against their religion, but it's like you've turned against the whole family. You know, and when we're out there, you know, preaching the gospel to a lot of Muslims in Punchbowl, I, I felt that was a big problem. Where someone would hear the gospel, a Muslim would hear the gospel, would think, well, this is awesome, this is great news. But I can't believe because it will cause me to be an outcast in my family. You know, there was one woman that I got saved, a letter to the Lord, a Muslim lady. And uh, she, but I came next week to bring her a Bible. And she sent me an email saying, look, I, I, I can't, my family won't let me. You know, I, you know and she just didn't want to be known as a believer. You know, she, she believed, she got saved, you know, but she's someone there that would, you know, deny Christ in a sense. And when she gets brought before the father, Christ will deny her because she's not willing to stand up and, and, and face that division in her family. But that's a reality, you know, uh, for, for many of you, it's, I feel really sad for people that have not grown up in a Christian home and have that division in their family. But that's what Jesus came and he, look, we shouldn't be surprised. Jesus taught us this was going to be a reality. Okay. Verse number 37, please. Matthew 10, verse 37. Now, we're near the end of this chapter now, and Christ really just reinforces the rewards. Okay? You serve me, me, don't fear man, don't fear what people can do unto you, just do what I've called you to do, and there's going to be great rewards for you. This is what Jesus finishes up in this chapter. Verse 37, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And again, once again, look, your own family could be the ones that stop you serving the Lord. Okay? Now, we should try to live peacefully with our family. But if God has called you to do a work, God's called you to go and serve Him, go to church, you know, go soul winning, your family may very well try to stop you from that. Okay? And if they stop you, that's you loving your family more than loving the Lord. Okay? But Jesus Christ wants us to love Him, to love God more than our own families in the sense that what God has called us to do must be a priority in our lives. Okay? Verse 38, And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. God wants us to take our cross as it were. He wants us to shoulder some burden of the work that He's left us to do so we can be worthy of Him. Again, this is not about salvation, okay? You, you're not, you, you can never be worthy for Him in a sense because we've all come short. You know, we're all sinners and we come short of the glory of God. It's Christ that makes us worthy. You know, it's His imputed righteousness once we believe in Him that makes us worthy to God. 
Okay, but what we can do in our walk, in our daily walk of life is be worthy of Christ to win Christ, as Paul talks about it, by doing the works that Christ has left us to do. And in verse 39, he that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Now, let me show you this very quickly, please. I wanted to show you this. Go to Luke 17. Go to Luke 17, verse 31. Because I want to show you, just in comparison here, Luke 17, verse 31. What does it mean in verse 39 when he said, He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Luke 17 verse 31. Luke 17 verse 31. This is talking about the last days as well. Okay, Another teaching of Christ on the last days. Look what he says. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down and take it, to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Now, we know that the end times is, is paralleled with the times of Sodom and Gomorrah, the time of Lot being cut, taken out and Sodom being destroyed. But look at verse 33. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. Remember what Jesus said before about enduring to the end. How do we preserve our life to the end? And then verse 34. I tell you that uh, in that night there shall be two men in one bed, and one shall be taken and the other one shall be left. So I believe this is talking about the rapture. One is taken and one, and the other one is left. So I just want to give you the context there about the end times. But I want to show you, if you can, just back in Luke 17, verse 31. So this is talking to brethren in Judea, believers in Judea, okay? That when the Antichrist comes and brings persecution to those people, the instruction is, in that day, he which shall be upon the housetop. If you're on the top of your house and his stuff in the house... Let him not come down to take it away. Don't go into your house and get all your stuff, is what he's saying. Okay? Don't come and get all your possessions. Don't come and get all the things that you, you think you need. Okay? And, and it says, and he that is in the field, uh, let him likewise not return back. If you're out in the field working, don't come back to your house and get your stuff, is what Jesus says. It's time to flee. It's time to go. And then verse 33, whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. Okay? Now, let me give you a quick illustration of this. Obviously, you guys know, I'll probably use an, I'm not sure if I use this analogy here, maybe in our church, but, you know, obviously flying every week, you know, and you get, the, um, you get the, all the safety instructions and the safety card, and they talk about how to evacuate a plane. So if a plane, you know, crash lands into, let's say, into the ocean or something like that, what they say is, don't take your stuff, okay? Don't take your bags, don't take your, you know, the, your things, just evacuate, you know, get out as quickly as possible, and you might be thinking, no, I, I need to get my things. I need to get my wallet. I need my wallet. I need my phone to call people if I need them. I need those kinds of things. But if everybody on the plane, let's say there's 100 people on the plane, if everyone's getting their things that they think they need, by the time they evacuate, the plane is probably going to be underwater by then. Okay? In order to save the most passengers, to get people out there, you need to evacuate quickly instead of causing uh, you know, a, a bottleneck situation where people aren't getting out. Okay? So there's a situation where you think you need to get all your things, you're actually going to slow down the evacuation and you could potentially lose your life. Okay? This is the same thing that we see here in, in the Bible when Jesus says, look, if, if it's that last day, if it's that, if it's that time, it's time to go. It's time to move on and, and flee into another city and continue the work of God elsewhere. Okay? Because if you go back trying to get the things you need, oh man, I need, I need a new, another jacket, I need to get my wallet, I need to get my phone, I need to get you know, extra food, I need to get all this stuff for my family you know, so, so we can survive. Well, if that's you, verse 33, whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. Okay? Those that are more concerned about saving and preserving your own life, you're going to be the one that, gets, that loses their life. But then it says, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. In the sense that if you're willing to go, you know what, God, I'm willing to lose my life. I'm going to go and flee to the other city. I'm just going to do the works that you called me to do. I'm just going to preach, you know, from the housetops, the things that you taught us. I'm just going to go and preach the gospel. If that means I lose my life, Lord, so be it. Those people are going to, are going to preserve their life. They're going to preserve it. Okay. So, you know, it's, it's contradictive to what we think in the last days. You think, oh man, I need to save myself, find a cave and hide. No, those people are going to lose their lives. The ones that go and do the work, and serve the Lord openly, they're the ones that are going to preserve their life. I don't know how, but that's the promise that we see from the Word of God. All right? So I wanted to give you that thought. Now let's uh, go back to Matthew 10, verse 40. I'm almost done now. Matthew 10, verse 40. Matthew 10, verse 40, it says, um, He that receiveth you, receiveth me. 
and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. So when you're going out and preaching the gospel, someone receives you, they believe on Christ. They, don't just they haven't just received you, they've received Christ. And they haven't just received Christ, but they receive the Father. Okay, because Jesus says, you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except by me. Okay, but it's an amazing thing that we get to represent Christ in that sense. Okay, and then in verse 41, it says, He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. You know, and I'm really thankful because, you know, obviously I travel from, from Queensland. I have many offers of people offering me food, offering me some place to stay. You know, you know what that means? The reward that I get for doing the work will be shared with you guys as well. You're going to get that same reward. Okay. It's, you, don't, you don't have to even do the work yourself. But because it says, that, look, he that receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. If, 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 you, if you, you're hospitable to, to a prophet, a prophet just means preacher. If you're hospitable to a preacher, you do the best you can to that person, then you're going to get the same reward the preacher gets. Okay, so, you know, you might say, well, I'm not someone that's in, in a position that I can go out and preach the gospel. You know, I've got illnesses, I've got little kids or anything like that. Yeah, but if you enable other people, other preachers, you will get that same reward as them as well. Okay, and look at this in verse number 42. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall no wise lose his reward. And just giving a cup of water to a little child. You know, in the name of a disciple, in the name of Jesus, as it were, you're going to get a reward just for doing the little things. Okay, it's an amazing thing. So it's not just doing the great works of God, but it's serving one another, guys. You know, and this should encourage us as a church that we should try to find areas that we can serve one another. Okay, you know, a drink of water or whatever, prayer, you know, brother, have you got anything you need me to pray for? You know, is there anything I can do to help you? You know, there are people in need. Is, is, are you able to fulfill that need? If you do those things, because you're serving a brother, you know, you're serving Christ as it will. And if you're serving Christ, then you're serving the Father. And you're going to get a reward just for those doing those, those small things. So I hope that gives you a great snapshot of Matthew chapter 10. Sorry that the sermon was a bit long. It was very deep, lots of layers there. But I hope you can see what Christ is teaching. All right? Don't fear man. Don't fear those that can hurt you. Okay? If you try to keep, uh, save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you're willing to lose it, you're going to preserve it. Christ wants us to endure until the end. And then if we're the last generation that goes through this period of time, God, Christ does not want us to fear. You know, he wants us to fear God first and foremost. Do the works that He's left us to do. You know, serve the brethren. Do what we know that Christ has told us. And somehow, supernaturally, Christ will make sure that our lives are preserved. And not only that, but there's going to come a time when He comes and He's going to give us those rewards. Okay? The great rewards that He's left us to do. So let's leave it there. Let's pray.